Coming up on DTNS, will Apple support low Earth orbit satellites on the iPhone? Why you might have Zoom dysmorphia and the new industry of renting out your likeness for AI deepfakes. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 30th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, I'm Rich Straffolino. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm producer. That is Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, yeah, Sarah Lane has the day off uh, today, uh, but if you follow her on Twitter, uh, she thanks you uh, for, for all of the, the heartwarming messages folks have been sending. Uh, if you'd like to get the wider conversation on our expanded show, we were just talking about old tech, five-inch TVs and shortwave radios. Good day, Internet has that. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you can join our top patrons like Daniel Dorado, John Atwood, and Pat Sheeran. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. ByteDance acquired the VR headset maker Pico in an undisclosed deal. Now, you may not have heard of Pico. They make standalone VR headsets for businesses and enterprises. But IDC estimates Pico was the third largest virtual reality headset maker globally in Q1 2021, with shipments up 44.7% on the year. The operators of Ragnarok ransomware organization closed shop. Uh, and released its universal decryption key. Ragnarok had been active since 2019 using the Ragnar Locker ransomware to target IT networks, collecting more than $4.5 million in documented ransom payments. The operators did not announce why they were shutting down. Fossil announced its Gen 6 smartwatches, which include Qualcomm's new Snapdragon Wear 4100 Plus SoC. These come in 42 millimeter and 44 millimeter case sizes, but regardless of which case size you get, you get a 1.28 inch round AMOLED screen, and it offers new health features like continuous heart rate tracking, a new blood oxygenation sensor, and a new built-in wellness app. These watches will support Wear OS 3 with an updated expected in 2022. The watches start at $299 and are available for pre-order. China's National Press and Publication Administration issued a notice that the country will limit minors, uh, you know, those younger than 18, to three hours of online gaming most weeks. Three hours a week. Previous rules limited minors to one and a half hours per day and extensions on holidays. Not anymore. Minors will only be able to play online between 8 and and 9 p.m. on Fridays, weekends, and public holidays. And Nissan partnered with Mitsubishi to launch a mini EV for the Japanese market that's coming in 2022. The vehicle will seat four, be bigger than a smart, than a smart car, but smaller than a Nissan Leaf, and offer a 20 kilowatt hour battery capacity, so kind of a city driver. Expected to start at around 2 million yen, that's about 18,200 US dollars, before subsidies. All right, let's talk a little more about uh, a reliable iPhone uh, leak slash rumor. Rob, what do we got? Well, Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo expects the next-gen iPhone will use a customized version of the Qualcomm X60 with support for communications over satellite. Kuo says this will let the phone feature a low-Earth orbit LEO satellite communication mode, letting users make calls and send messages when outside of standard cell reception. There's a lot we don't know about how this all could actually work. It could be used to support communication over Apple services like iMessage and FaceTime, or it could be a fallback for emergency communications. There's also the question of whether Apple will charge to use this feature or offer it as a free service like access to GPS satellites. Quo also expects LEO satellite communication to be supported in reportedly upcoming Apple product categories like an AR headset, an Apple car, and IoT devices. My first reaction to this with Quo saying it's also going to be used in other products is that Apple has decided to use a little bit of that cash uh, uh, to, to invest in uh, some kind of service that they can share out among their devices. Uh, I'm going to guess it's probably emergency service related, uh, although it might be allowed to be used for non-emergency things like when you're out uh, hiking or something and you can't get other service to let you communicate with your other hiking partners or something like that. Uh, I, I can't decide whether they'll charge for it or not. Uh, I could absolutely see them including it in a bundle because they're so subscription oriented right now, but I don't see them making it a solo uh, money-making opportunity, if I'm right about the emergency part. 
Yeah, I could see this being uh, uh, what Apple Satellite and Apple Satellite Plus, where you get the, you know, you get the emergency, you know, you can call the, the basic nine one one, no matter what. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. And then, and then, if you want to, uh, as part of some sort of tier, I mean, my question is though, you know, this is kind of gloss, uh, not glossed over, but like, you know, a customized version of a Qualcomm X sixty, that hides, I think, a lot of. I don't, I don't know what kind of radios are going to be needed for this kind of satellite communication, but the fact that you're talking about FaceTime message which you know could be transporting media i mean this is not in oh it just be voice and text my guess data. is the qualcomm x60 x60 can support communication with the low earth orbit satellites and those are only uh voice and text it's very okay. minimal stuff you're not getting any data over that okay yeah, my thought was it just makes it look like uh, Star Trek. I mean, everything will just be networked and works everywhere on the planet, no matter what. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. You know, guys, I don't really use Apple, so Samsung needs to steal this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the other thing I have to, you know, is this going to be, we've already seen, obviously there's a lot of activity with low earth orbit, you know, internet delivery and that kind of stuff. With this, presumably if this comes to pass and this is in the next gen iPhone, if this will start, you know, obviously I, I believe Apple's obviously just uh, going to be leasing time or, or some sort of, uh, uh, you know, business arrangement with existing low earth orbit satellites. If we will see that kind of push and how quickly uh, that could become kind of a standard emergency feature uh, on devices, which would be great because I mean, you know, so I, I was, I've been driving around quite a bit in Ohio and uh, even on the highways, turns out cell reception, dicey uh, uh, sometimes once you get out of a major metro. Um, news I'm, to everybody, I know, but I know, I know. I want to walk. I want to walk back a little bit by saying no data because I can already hear the clattering keyboards. You can do data over these satellites, but it's such a low bandwidth rate with what we're talking about. Probably depends on what they're going with, but what I'm guessing is it's very low bandwidth. So the d data they would push out would be very, very low bandwidth. I don't think it would support FaceTime video is really all I'm, I should have said. <laughs> well, yeah, and I would imagine if, you know, we're already talking about an at, basically an add-on modem that Apple is using. So I would also think the concern here would be with battery life. The, you know, these 5G modems are, uh, you know, uh, not notoriously not super power efficient, especially when they're not integrated, you know, into the main chipset. So I have to imagine that uh, if Apple's going to be adding this on, um, like Tom, like you were saying, that this is something that already supports and they're integrating some sort of software or firmware or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So it's not I mean, despite it. the fact that they consistently sue each other all the time, I think <laughs> Qualcomm and Apple do work together on, on you know, adapting the products uh, regularly. So that part of it doesn't make it sound, it, it would be easy to look at that and go, oh, they're adapting it. What are they doing? My guess is, is like it's a very standard adaptation just to include the satellite service. And that that's interesting. Yeah, and the idea of adding this to the car uh, or, or you know IoT devices also you know kind of like that that kind of emergency services like yeah. I mean kind of on starish if we <laughs> in a, in a car setting in a weird way yeah. uh, but I could definitely see that being a major you know kind of Apple Apple satellite network selling point or whatever, however they're going to brand and it. part of the uh, of uh, the Find My network right yeah. to be able yeah. to increase the range of all that kind of stuff uh, that that should be kind of cool yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, next up, upgrade support for Windows 11 has generated uh, not a insignificant amount of confusion with some mixed messaging around what CPUs will actually be supported. But this has all been limited to upgrades from Windows 10. We're having this discussion about that, not manually installing the OS on an older machine. Now, Microsoft confirmed it won't block users installing Windows 11 on older PCs manually using ISO or ISO files. These requ The requirements to get the OS running using a manual install are pretty straightforward. 64-bit, one gigahertz processor with two or more cores, four gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage. However, the company told The Verge that manual installs on the OS may not be entitled to get Windows updates, even security ones, and is mainly meant to be used by businesses evaluating the OS. Microsoft won't guarantee driver compatibility or system reliability for those installs. Microsoft also announced the systems with Intel's Core X series, Xeon W series, and the Core 7820HQ found in the Surface Studio 2 specifically are supported in Windows 11, but said there would be no support for AMD Zen 1 based CPUs, though the workaround we just mentioned would apply to those manually installing it. The company plans to update its PC Health Check app to include the updated CPU support information and provide clarity why your system might not be able to upgrade. Uh, Rob, I know for businesses, 
is, you know, this kind of manual install question, uh, you know, for in terms of validating Windows 11 and kind of testing it to get it up and running is important. So a, a good confirmation for Microsoft on that regard, right? Absolutely, because enterprises, they still physically go to machines. Now, they're not necessarily walking a cart to a machine and upgrading it right there, but they're doing it with some type of back office and they're not necessarily doing that upgrade over the internet. And you're going to still see a lot of companies do this because they build their PC with an image that has all the software and all the stuff that they want to run on that machine. So they're going to continue to do that um, for the foreseeable future. Um, the other thing I, I know about Microsoft is that what they said to the Virgin that they may actually not support some of this stuff. Well, they, that's just giving them an out for the oldest of the old that someone has figured out how to get this to run on. Microsoft knows that they're going to try to support everything that can realistically run um, this platform because Earth still kind of standardized on Windows. I know that, you know, Apple is doing an awesome job with, you know, their platform, but business still runs on these Windows machines, business still runs on Linux. So uh, they, they've got to get that figured out. And I don't think that they're going to, uh, you know, just, if you were able to get it installed, we're just going to leave you out there in the cold. They're probably going to go back. And I say that because they've always done that. They always stick things around a little bit longer than what they say they're going to. So I think this is just giving themselves a realistic out that well, we may not support this, but we probably will. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're on an enterprise contract, Microsoft's not going to screw you over, <laughs> right? They they want to they want to keep those dollars coming in. So uh, this is meant for the person, you know, that the Yahoo like me who went and stuck Windows 11 on my you know 15 year old HP, and then Microsoft's going to be like, that's great. If it goes wrong, it's not. We're not supporting that. That's that's all you. You you have you have fun with that. So uh, the the messaging on this really has become quite confusing. But honestly, I think the majority of people who have a Windows machine are going to be able to upgrade to Windows 11 just fine. There may be yeah, other problems with majority. Windows 11, but yeah, the the path to upgrade will be there. It's only hobbyists. Uh, and and people who are you know really trying to eke out all the life out of a machine as possible that are even going to run into these scenarios. And it looks like Microsoft trying to bend over backwards to be like, look, we can't afford to support you know and write drivers and everything for this stuff, but we'll at least let you do it. We're gonna we're gonna try right. not to actively get in your way. Yeah, and, the, and the nice thing about this for just regular Windows users is that they're going to put into Windows Update a, you know, just a screen that's going to tell you whether or not your specific machine can be upgraded or not. And it's probably going to be in the form of, hey, you can upgrade to Windows 11, click here to get all the new benefits. So as you said, Tom, the overwhelming majority of Windows users are going to be just fine with Windows 11. And it's important to, to just kind of remind everybody that also like when Windows 11 comes out, Windows 10 does not exit support. In fact, Microsoft yeah. has had a, has a, a timeline out that gives multiple years of Windows 10. So if you are not able to upgrade, it's not like, you know, the OS is, you know, unsupported or kaput or anything like that after that point. Right. So now is the time to upgrade your Windows 7 machines to Windows 10. <laughs> is that what you're saying? Uh... <laughs> It's finally safe. All right. We've talked about the impact of remote work uh, from a lot of different tech angles over the last year and a half or so. Uh, pressures on supply chains for webcams, the importance of available home broadband, what happens to you if you don't have that. Wired has a report on a new survey from Harvard published in the International Journal of Women's Dermatology identifying how the explosion of video conferencing is impacting how people see themselves. It's a disorder, and the reason why it's in the Journal of Women's Dermatology, called Zoom dysmorphia. The idea that apps cause body image disorders is not the new part. In fact, if you remember, the term Snapchat dysmorphia has been around for a while, since 2015. That refers to patients going to places like plastic surgeons and trying to achieve the look of a Snapchat filter in real life. The difference with Zoom dysmorphia is that while Snapchat filters are a conscious, conscious effort to look like Snapchat with, you know, like put some sparkles on me or whatever, video conferencing is causing an effect people want to avoid, not imitate. The wide angle of a webcam, its close proximity, can exaggerate the size of your nose and make your eyes look smaller. Combine that with an unflattering low angle that you may not realize is causing uh, a perception change. Your bored meeting expression, uh, which is different than the relaxed expression you have when you look at yourself in the mirror, all of that 
is having doctors seeing people change their self-perception and request more cosmetic procedures. The study found 71% of 7,000 respondents were stressed out about returning to in-person activities. 30% of them planned to invest in changing their appearance as a way to cope with going back out in the real world. In fact, among 18 to 24 year olds, those using filters on video conferencing were most likely to have accessed mental health services. Dermatologist Shadi Karush told Wired, the best way to fight Zoom dysmorphia is through awareness. Know that you're not the only one who thinks you have something wrong with your appearance because of the way you look on Zoom and know that Zoom is distorting how you look. And that's that's not really what other people see. Well, and the other big thing that I, I feel like for this effect is also, and this is a, like another documented kind of effect, is the mirror image result where you're the only way you've ever seen yourself is in a mm -hmm. mirror, right? So you you think your hair parts a certain way and stuff like that. And in every pretty much every video conferencing thing, it gives you how you're appearing to other people. And that in itself can have almost like a disorienting effect, at least short term, and adds in, you know, to all these other things. Um, it's it's kind of funny, you know, like like wide angle lenses are considered like the least ideal when you're talking about portrait photography for all of these effects. You know, it takes everything that, that like everything falls away and makes the thing that's closest have like the most prominent in the image. If that's your nose or, or you know, something that you're, you know, not necessarily wanting to be the most prominent thing in the image can definitely like have that effect. And sure, staring, but this has been, we've had video conferencing for a while, but this is different than, oh, a half hour call once a week to all of a sudden spending, you know, multiple hours every single day on Zoom and having, you know, one of these more knock-on effects that we're seeing um, from kind of this, uh, this uh, switch to more hybrid work. Yeah, you make a great point about the mirror image because you're actually seeing yourself different than what you normally see yourself. And it's the same result, people who listen to themselves for the first few times um, on audio, you can't stand how you sound. You don't sound like yourself. That's because you hear yourself through your head as compared to <laughs> through your ears. So this is, uh, you know, even if, the, if you weren't using a wide angle lens, people probably would still be a bit uncomfortable until they get used to how they appear on camera, simply because if you're not looking at a mirror image, you're not looking at what you've looked at for decades of your life. Then add on to that the fact that you're not a professional lighter, you're not a professional photographer, cinematographer. <laughs> uh, and so a lot of your perceptions may just mean you need better lighting or, or you need to frame yourself better or move the camera back a little or something. And suddenly you'd be like, oh, I guess I don't look that bad. Uh, but it, it may seem obvious to some people out there, but a lot of people don't realize that. They think, oh, I point the camera at me and that's reality. That That's what I actually look like in this room, right? The camera doesn't lie. Well, the camera doesn't lie, but it definitely distorts the truth. And this may be, a a, maybe a subtle benefit or, or at least a reason to maybe pursue maybe a VR meeting strategy like we've saw with Facebook's Horizon Workspace, Workplace, whatever they're calling it. Like the idea that you, you know, you have this avatar. So it's okay, you're not looking at yourself, you're looking at how you want to present mm -hmm. yourself. Aside from all the other benefits of, oh, okay, I can be in, I can be in a space and I can be looking around. Also having being able to kind of distance yourself from your avatar versus you sitting in, you know, your home office or, or wherever you're at may be a subtle benefit that we're not even thinking of. I'm all for that because I can just go back to not having to iron the top half of my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so, something to, to keep in mind and maybe it's not going to affect you, but it might affect somebody in your friends or family uh, who's like, man, I, I need to get work done and you can you could sort of tell them like well if you if you tried tweaking your lighting first maybe that's all it is hey folks you want an ad free version of dtns support us on patreon and get your own personal rss feed supported directly by you no need to have an ad in it you're paying for it find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash patreon Rob, tell us about uh, this this new uh, uh, AI generated uh, avatar system going on. Absolutely. So MIT Technology Review profiled Hour One, a startup that licenses real human likeness for AI generated videos. The company has about 100 AI generated characters so far that can be used for videos with over 40 clients. People don't need any acting chops, just a willingness to license their appearance. They receive a micro payment every time the client licenses the video with their likeness. You don't have a say, however, in how your likeness is going to be used, but 
Um, our one has a policy that says it won't use certain industries such as gambling, sex, and politics. Anyone can apply, but our one looks for a wide variety of characteristics and age and racial backgrounds. There are a few more than 100 people on board, 80% of which are under 50 years old, 70% are female, and 25% are white. If you're selected as an actor, a 4K camera fills you talking and making different facial expressions in front of a green screen. The voice is either produced by text-to-speech or for a higher fee, recorded by pro voice actors. The algorithms then turn all that data into a model of the actor that can say whatever customers want in any language. This has got SAG AFTRA's attention, the union for actors, because a lot of actors, especially actors that aren't, you know, Brad Pitt, supplement their income or even pay the rent by doing appearances for uh, an instructional video or or a training video or a customer support video. Those are time consuming and somewhat expensive, you know, as expensive as a major motion picture, but but they're costly because you have to get everybody in one place. You have to do good lighting, good photography. Uh, this cuts out all of that expense. And yet it still seems to be supporting the person like in licensing their image. It just broadens it. You don't have to be an actor. You don't have to be able to do anything other than fit the profile of, of the variety of types of people they're looking for. And then you get passive income uh, because I think what I was surprised is that they're not just paying you a flat fee. They're, they are giving you royalties every time your image is licensed, but you don't have to do anything. The AI does all the work. Yeah, and in the in the technology review piece, they said you know that's it's not like you're getting like ten cents per time your video is used. They said it was in the dollar range. So theoretically, you know, we, there were there were clients that they were citing that were producing you know dozens if not hundreds of videos, kind of using these avatars. So you know, if, if you were picked up by a brand or something that theoretically that might be a, a not insubstantial uh, passive income for you. What is what's interesting to me is this is almost like the the stock photoification of video, right? Where it's, you know, you can, uh, again, it's that same kind of passive income. Uh, I'm going to let anybody use this. I guess, you know, in terms of gambling, sex and politics, I guess religion wasn't the third rail in that regard. I, I thought that was just kind of interesting, but. Well, it says including. Did, well, did, are true. you sure I, religion I isn't not, included? I have yeah. not checked the the yeah, ethics yeah. policy for hour one, which I want to call one hour photo every single time. <laughs> uh, but the, it, I, it, it raises some questions, but I feel like this isn't the company that's going to do it wrong. It's the idea, though, that seemingly they're limited by, uh, uh, you know, wanting to roll out quality, quote unquote, characters versus the technology. The technology is like clearly there for this to be a business model for them right now. In, in my opinion, you're going to see a lot of people who aren't going to like this. You know, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, I'm from Warren, Ohio. Lordstown is the biggest plant there. And automation is a is a big deal. These robots that are now doing the jobs of what people can do. It's the same thing here. It's different, but it's, you know, different industry. But clearly it's the same type of thing. You're now going to allow machines to do the job that people used to be able to do. So I am, you know, kind of encouraged that they are going to still go to actual people instead of using AI generated faces, um, you know, for this. Um, but we're, it's like I said, right now they've only got a hundred. So there's a, there's a lot of growing um, that this industry is going to see in the coming, coming months, coming years. Yeah. I, I, I almost feel like this is a, an example of why it's never as bad as you think, because instead of, like you said, Rob, instead of having the AI generate people and just throwing all the actors out of work, it's shifting from the actors having to spend a lot of time and having a lot of cost to broadening. Now more people can get paid to do this. They probably won't get paid as much. That's the rub. Also, it's throwing the photographers and the sound guy and the lighting guy. Actually, the sound guy can get work doing the voiceovers, <laughs> I suppose, but the lighting guy and the photographer uh, are, are not gonna get these jobs because they're done in AI. So it definitely shifts things around and adds some opportunities while taking others away. Yeah, the the idea that okay, if if the amount of video made today stays the same and uses the system, yes, an actor would earn less money. However, this opens the door to very quickly being well, able to produce more yeah. video, and then mm -hmm. you would have theoretically need more actors. And yes, it would you know theoretically Ber maybe there would be a little bit more of a spectrum of 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 shift. There. In the article, Berlitz uh, was one of the clients that's using this because they couldn't possibly make all the videos they needed for their foreign language instruction, but they can now because 
they can just use this uh, to to do it. And, it. and it makes something possible that they couldn't have done before at any cost. All right, well, finishing up here, Xbox user Gabriel Rowland shared on Twitter that a gamer pick avatar he acquired back in 2006 was still in use on his Xbox account, but had not aged well, displaying in its native 72 by 72 pixels. Hey, that was good in 2006, but it now had gray borders and was poorly cropped inside of the now default round profile pictures. Xbox engineering lead Eden Marie replied that she made it her personal mission to fix it. She not only helped out uh, uh, Gabrielle, but uh, announced a fix to improve the rendering of all old gamer pick avatars originally purchased for the Xbox 360. A fix is rolling out now to the alpha ring of Xbox insiders, and it now upscales the gamer picks and uses a transparency layer to better fit them in those circular icons. Rest assured, your your gamer points that you used to purchase your your uh, gamer picks. It's still good. They they found a way to keep it alive. So who knows if Microsoft was thinking about this before this tweet got to someone who could actually do something <laughs> about it. Um, but if the tweet is what moved action on this, I'm just I'm just happy that sometimes Twitter actually works for good. <laughs> well, that was the funny thing is that uh, Eden said that the, the bug report, quote unquote, uh, from the Twitter post just made her laugh and that made her want to check it out and go into it. But then I, you know, cause I was kind of skeptical. I was like, okay, how many people could do this? Going through the comments to the tweet, a lot of people sharing uh, some poorly cropped 72 by 72 pixel uh, uh, gamer tags that they were still using or, or whatever gamer picks that they were still using. Uh, so uh, maybe helping some people out and uh, getting some, certainly getting some goodwill uh, along the way for sure. So they're supporting gamer pick avatars longer than any of their operating systems. <laughs> <laughs> that is, yes, that is clear. And that's also discovering, some long term <laughs> service right there. Let me tell you. And also discovering that like it, the, the feature itself, like back in 2006 supported transparencies, which I guess no documentation showed. So there uh, also a journey of discovery mm. for the gamer pick <laughs> from Xbox 360. <laughs> I mean, I, if they made it, if they're just gifts, Give supported transparency forever. Yeah, so I, I guess I, that makes sense. I suppose. Yeah. Huh. All right. Uh, we are going to take a quick peek in the mailbag and go, wow, uh, that's a lot of mail. Thank you. Uh, we got so much good feedback from people about the experiment week shows we did last week. One of my favorites was one person who was like, you know, I didn't really love any of them, but I'm really glad you did it. I enjoyed sampling them. Uh, like they didn't, they didn't have to find one they loved to, to enjoy like having new stuff to try out. And uh, that is the, ex the experiment week spirit to me is like, we're, we're trying all these things out. So if you have listened to the shows from last week, but have not let us know what you think, keep it coming. Uh, feedback at daily tech news show.com. We really, really do appreciate it. And we want to say a big thank you to our brand new bosses, Tyler Glaze, Nicholas Newen, Jeremy D. Strickland, Barry K., Steve James, Kevin Wheat, Richard Vogel, and Tyler Vilhauer, uh, who just all started backing us on Patreon. Thank you to Tyler, Nicholas, Jeremy, Barry, Steve, Kevin, and Richard. Woo! Yeah. We didn't, we didn't miss y'all. Uh, we we saw you uh, all, all last week. So yeah, ah uh, man, it's nice to get uh, new patrons, even when we're not on every day. You know, uh, pushing for that. So I really, really appreciate that, y'all. Thank you for that. And someone else who I dearly appreciate, of course, Rob Dunwood. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Rob. Uh, where can people find more of your great stuff? Oh, it's there, always so. a pleasure being on. And I am at everything Rob Dunwood. And after uh, last week, I've discovered Twitter mentions. So I'm going to pay attention to Twitter. And you can also get me on my uh, weekly podcast over at smrpodcast.com. All right. And remember, we are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson. See you then. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> this show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. <laughs>